Okay, okay look, thank you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome here today. I'm delighted that you could come along. Uh, the ANU School of Music has a proud history. Uh, it's also a history, however, that's seen continual funding crises and indeed major reviews of the school in, 2000, sorry, in 1998, in 2004, in 2008, and now again in 2012. So today we're going to announce changes which will address the underlying issues uh, which have resulted in that continual situation. We're going to address the fundamental issues that have existed within the school now for more than a decade. We will outline a curriculum model which will guarantee both the academic sustainability and the financial viability of the school once and for all. A model which will allow the school to prosper and grow rather than continually contract. Over the last month, we've gone through a very detailed and very public consultation process. We've had numerous responses from staff, from students, from the general community. And those responses have told us a number of very clear things. They've told us the importance of performance in a music education, and in that context, the importance of adequate one-to-one -one tuition for students. They've told us the important role that the School of Music plays in the musical life of the broader ACT and Canberra community. They've told us the value of opening up uh, a university education in music to a broader cohort of students and the importance of building pathways for students, not just within an undergraduate education, but also through to postgraduate education. And the need, lastly, but not leastly, the need to be able to build both an academically and financially sustainable school, which can have a secure future, which can grow, and in doing that, won't be an unacceptable burden on the broader university community. We've heard these messages, we've heard them clearly, and the response which we're announcing today addresses each and every one of those concerns which come out of the consultation process. From 2013, we'll introduce a new degree structure for the Bachelor of Music at ANU. It's a structure which has two clear streams, one in performance and one in what's called inquiry. Students enrolling in the program will undertake a major in one of those streams and a minor in the other. Students coming into the performance stream will enter by audition, ensuring that they have the high level of performance skills that are required for students in such a program. Students entering into the inquiry stream as a major will do so based on their year 12 results, thus ensuring that we can widen the uh, group of students who can enter the Bachelor of Music program once and for all. In 2013, we're going to target enrolments into the program of 50 into the performance stream and 30 into the inquiry stream. A total of 80 students coming into the program, which compares to the 70 currently enrolling in the school each year. Importantly, all students who undertake a performance major will be guaranteed a minimum of one hour per week of one-to-one -one tuition. And that one-to-one -one tuition, however, will be delivered by an approved group uh, of external tutors to the university rather than largely being delivered by staff within the school itself. The music inquiry stream includes things like composition, musicology, music education, management and policy in music, uh, pathways to research. Uh, indeed, these are the areas which 80% of our graduates actually work in. And by introducing that stream, will broaden the, uh, both the intake of students, but also more adequately prepare many students for their future careers. Now, this model we're proposing with these two streams, and indeed uh, with one-to-one -one tuition being given largely by external tutors to the university, is not a model unique to ANU. It's actually a model very commonly used by high-quality universities around the world. And the examples I give are indeed the music programs at Cambridge, Oxford and Harvard, which all use exactly this same model to deliver their music education. In short, we'll retain a very strong performance stream within the program, but we'll have an overall curriculum which is broader than at present. We'll ensure that we can still produce high quality performance students, but we'll also ensure 
that students have the breadth of education that one would expect when they graduate from a university like ANU. These changes have significant implications for staff. The changes to the degree structure mean that the staff numbers within the school will decrease by some 13 full-time equivalent positions. 24 academic staff members will reduce to 13 and 10 administrative positions down to eight. There are, however, a number of groups that explicitly will not be impacted by this. There are a number of externally funded uh, research positions within the school, funded by the Australian Research Council. They are not impacted by these changes. The university provides a pre-tertiary program that is, we actually provide staff who teach into the secondary school music program uh, within the ACT. That's funded by the ACT government. The staff in that program and the program itself will not be impacted by these changes. There's a position of university organist, which is not affected, and there are four additional general staff positions responsible for venues. They essentially maintain equipment and facilities within Llewellyn Hall, and they are not impacted by these changes as well. The new staffing structure, 13 academic positions, that is a head of school and 12 other positions, has been determined based on the teaching loads required to deliver the new program. But it's interesting to compare that with other great university programs around the world. I mentioned before Oxford, Cambridge and Harvard have similar degree structures to this. And indeed, the similarities with Cambridge go further than that. Um, ANU within its School of Music uh, has about 200 students. Cambridge has 250 in our new program, we're intending to have 13 academic staff. Cambridge has 14. So I think you can see that even on those comparisons, the level of staffing we're proposing for this form of delivery uh, is comparable to other quality institutions. Clearly, a reduction in staff like this is a traumatic and difficult process and one that I don't uh, approach uh, with any uh, glee at all. It is a, a very difficult process and I acknowledge that and I acknowledge the stress on staff and indeed students as a result of these changes. We have over the last three weeks uh, worked with the National Tertiary Education Union uh, to develop a quite uh, complex uh, and detailed process uh, as to how we would go through uh, the reduction in staff. Uh, which will include all of the normal processes which exist within our enterprise agreement. That is, we will initially look at things like uh, whether staff can be redeployed to other parts of the university, whether there are options for voluntary separation, for uh, early retirement, uh, for staff moving on to part-time employment, uh, as well as other options uh, before we get to issues like redundancy. Within the core complement of staff, as I said before, uh, 13, staff will be employed in two, the two streams, that is in performance and indeed inquiry. So there will continue to be uh, a cohort of, of competent performance uh, teachers as well as competent inquiry teachers within the school itself to be able to administer the programs and indeed to be able to provide uh, the bulk of the teaching uh, of standard classroom activities that makes up, in fact, the majority of the degree itself. The changes uh, also potentially have impacts on our existing students uh, and the university is very cognizant of these and indeed has legal requirements uh, to ensure that it does not disadvantage our existing students. Uh, we have started and will continue to go through a very detailed process of mapping the course requirements for every one of those students. The undertaking we make is that every one of our existing students will be able to complete the degree that they enrolled in the curriculum that they enrolled in, and we will individually look at every single student's enrolment and work with them to determine exactly which courses they need to complete uh, and over how they will do that to be able to complete their degree in the minimum time uh, which would be reasonable for any course. As I mentioned before, the feedback process um, went into great detail in terms of uh, the very important role that the school plays in the broader ACT community. Uh, and the university understands that important role that the school plays. And we believe that these changes will not adversely impact that role. We will continue to produce a similar number of performance trained students as in the existing program. Those students will be available to play uh, in a whole range of community activities just as they do today. In fact, the new curriculum will actually give students academic credit for their involvement with the community. And so they will be both encouraged uh, to do that uh, and also supported to do that. 
There has been a lot of comment uh, on the potential impact that these changes might make on the Canberra Symphony Orchestra. The university acknowledges that the CSO is an important part uh, of the culture of the ACT and we also acknowledge and recognise uh, that the orchestra is not funded in the same way uh, that all other state orchestras are funded. Uh, however, we believe that when you look at the hard numbers, there will not be a significant impact on the CSO. If you look at recent programs of the Canberra Symphony Orchestra, and these, have been, these numbers have been confirmed by the CEO of the Canberra Symphony Orchestra, between seven and nine uh, ANU students regularly play in the CSO. Those students will still be available to do that in the future. Uh, contrary to what a lot of people have speculated, there are in fact only four ANU staff of a total complement of 70 within the CSO who regularly play within the orchestra. One of those staff is in fact a part-time employee of the university. So even if all those staff uh, were unsuccessful in, in finding a position within the school in the future and left Canberra, I don't believe that impact would be significant, four out of a total of 70. I also, as I mentioned before, two other elements which are important in terms of uh, the ACT community is the pre-tertiary program which the university runs, uh, where our staff support music within the secondary school system. That is not impacted and will not change as a result of these changes. And secondly, there has been much speculation about Llewellyn Hall. Can I say all of it is unfounded? Access to Llewellyn Hall will not change. Um, community groups, the CSO, everyone who accesses the, the hall at the present time, none of those issues will be impacted by these changes. There are also significant impacts on the ANU community itself. The university recognises that programs like music and indeed art and languages are ones which don't fit the normal funding model for universities. We explicitly in our budget model recognise this and for many years have provided music across subsidy of about $1.4 million per year. That will continue in the future. There will be no reduction in that cross subsidy. But even with that cross subsidy, the school can't go close to balancing its budget. For 2012, it now looks like the deficit will be $2.9 million. That's an annual deficit, 2.9 million every year. So that's 1.5 uh, even when you take into account the cross-subsidy that's provided. The university cannot increase that cross-subsidy. If we do, what it does is it impacts on other excellent schools and other education programs within the university. To further increase the subsidy means that we need essentially to take the money from other student programs to be able to support this program. We believe the 1.4 is one which can be justified, but more than that becomes very difficult. Let me give you some context to that. So a deficit of $2.9 million per year. The total budget for our School of Philosophy is less than that, and philosophy is ranked number six in the world. The total budget for our School of History is smaller than the annual deficit for the School of Music, and history is ranked number 12 in the world. The sort of deficit we're talking about here is very significant uh, when you look at these humanities disciplines. So the university will continue to provide uh, that subsidy, that cross-subsidy of $1.4 million, and this new uh, model which we're uh, introducing will mean that with that cross-subsidy, the school will be able to balance its budget in future years. It will essentially follow the same path that other universities have seen necessary to do. That is to move to what's commonly called around the world a university model for music education as, com as compared to the conservatorium model which we've had over recent years. In conclusion, one further point. There has been discussion about the role of philanthropy, the opportunity for benefactors, both individuals and indeed businesses, to be able to support music. And indeed, philanthropy has been an important part uh, of the history of the School of Music. Benefactors currently support a broad range of scholarships within the school. The new model we're proposing uh, with one-to-one -one tuition given by external uh, tutors through a performance development allowance is one which lends itself to support from an endowment. Uh, and over the coming weeks, uh, we'll be testing whether there's an appetite for people within Canberra, for businesses within Canberra, to create such an endowment. If that were possible, in fact, we could take the current situation of one hour per week for one-to-one -one tuition to something exceeding that. 
and that would indeed set the school up as being a leader in Australia, that is, providing a higher level of one-to-one -one tuition than any other music school. So in conclusion, the changes today will address the issues that people have raised. It will ensure that the uh, new bachelor's program in music uh, has a vibrant performance stream. It will open the degree up to a broader range of students. It will ensure that students have the same amount, uh, as a minimum, the same amount of one-to-one -one tuition that they already ex receive. And it will do this in a way where the school can be academically and financially viable into the future. Thank you, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions that people might have. Professor Young, you said there's 13 FTE going. How many actual people are going to be affected by this? Uh, there are, so the reduction is, is effectively, um, so in terms of uh, academic staff, it's from 24 to 13, uh, so that's 11, and in terms of general staff, from 10 to 8, so that's 2. So in total, 13 people. 13 people and 13 FTE. That's correct. And what about the money that's going to be saved from this? Um, how, how much money is the university actually going to save out of this? Well, the, the, the current deficit is, is $2.9 million. We provide a cross-subsidy of $1.4. Um, so the difference between those two numbers is $1.5 million. And that's part of the budget of our College of Arts and Social Sciences. So essentially, that's money which is currently coming from our history or philosophy or um, uh, social sciences programs uh, to, cross sub to further cross-subsidise uh, this program. So that money goes back into those education programs. So you're saying that there will just be a $1.4 million debt ongoing? There will be, that's right. The, the university will provide a cross-subsidy of $1.4 million, and with that, it will be able, the school will be able to balance its budget. Um, at the present time, uh, Professor Howard Morphy is acting as head of school. Uh, we're in the process of finding a, uh, of searching for a new interim head. So we're going to find someone uh, probably for a period of 18 months to do the transition process. Uh, and during that period of time, we will then search for a permanent head. What's your time frame on that? Uh, we, will have, we will have a new interim head in place before the end of this year. On that, last time we were here, Marty Hughes Warrington said that Adrian Walter was the architect of the previous changes. Who's the architect of these ones? Um, so Adrian hasn't been involved in the changes. I mean, the, the, what we're announcing today broadly builds on what we originally said. Uh, and so the people who have been involved in this uh, are a small group from the school itself, uh, Marnie as, uh, as Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Academic and myself. Um, Professor, you're talking about external tuition. The other three universities you seem to be quoting extensively are Harvard, Oxford and Cambridge. They obviously are near very, very large population centres where there would be a pool of available tutors. Canberra is not near a very large population centre. Is it realistic to compare the outside tuition model of those Harvard, Oxford and Cambridge with, with AMU? OK, well, first thing you need to realise is that um, already about 50% of the teaching within the school is done by external people. Um, so even today, uh, there are 17 performance positions within the school, but there are 30 other staff that are employed on a sessional basis from outside the school itself. And about half the instruments are actually taught by external people. So there's already a pool out there doing that. Uh, and during the consultation process, uh, we've been approached by a very broad range of what appear to be very well uh, qualified people who would be interested in this. The other element, uh, although you say we're not near a major population source, uh, the other undertaking we're going to make to students is that um, should it be necessary for them to be able to source uh, the appropriate level of one-on-one -on -one tuition in, say, Sydney, uh, we'll be able to, with this model, provide uh, the resources for students, for instance, to travel to Sydney to be able to access uh, that, uh, that tuition. Um, in principle, I think there are a number of significant advantages with, uh, with a model like this. At the present time, we have excellent staff employed within the school, but if you're a student who comes to study a particular instrument, you take potluck as to whether we have a staff member within the school who can actually cover that or not. And indeed, if we do, you get a person who teaches that instrument with their particular style. And you know, there are different styles of, 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 uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, performance for different instruments. Under a new program like this, it will give students an opportunity um, to be able to choose from an approved set of people and, and to be able to have a breadth of choice so that they can actually um, you know, choose somebody who actually meets the particular requirements, the particular entrance int that they have. So is the travel money actually going to come out of the bursary or is it separate to the bursary? And 
Um, well, we've got to determine just how large that will be. My, my belief at the present time uh, is that the majority of the people will be able to find here in Canberra. Um, from what I've seen, uh, the depth of talent is larger than, than people have actually indicated. Um, but the, um, if indeed people need to travel to, to Sydney, uh, we'll determine the magnitude of that uh, and whether that's something we can actually uh, cover from the existing performance development allowance uh, or whether it's something which we need to fund separately or indeed it's something where philanthropic support might be able to augment the, uh, the situation. So it's not definite at this stage? Yes, we think it's a, really, it's a fairly small part of the total uh, package. The really interesting thing about this is that if you actually look at the present time, the one-on-one -on -one tuition is critically important. We all, we all know that. But it's one hour each week of a total student's load, and that one hour totally dominates the whole budget of the school. Now, all of the other teaching uh, essentially becomes a second fiddle to this, to this single hour. In the new model, that one-on-one -on -one tuition, in terms of the financial impacts, becomes a much more manageable thing within the total budget. So uh, some costs for a student to, to travel to, to Sydney for uh, a day or two doesn't become a major issue in terms of the overall budget. Can you give us an indication of how many submissions you received, the size of those submissions? Um, I think uh, in total we received something like about uh, 700 submissions. Um, from, from a whole range of, of people. Do you, you say that you gave them due consideration, but how many people did you actually have looking at those submissions and going through them? Um, the, the, the working group which we have, uh, which has been working on this now for um, about four weeks, consists of about six people. So do you think that it's accurate to say that you gave due consideration to 700 submissions? And I've seen some of those submissions mm -hmm. and they're 15, you know, some of them are uh, 15 pages long, some of them are longer. Yeah, the, can I say the ones that are 15 pages longer uh, or longer is a very small number. Um, the vast majority of submissions are less than a page uh, in length. Um, and indeed, we've read all of those submissions, including the one from the school itself, which was probably the ones you're, you're talking about, but from a range of other people. And yes, we have read all those. We've taken into uh, great detail the comments which we made here. And I think you can distill the key issues which people raised into those five or six dot points that I mentioned right at the start. Uh, people have said that the enrolments are going to be trashed, at least for next year. What kind of financial provision have you given to falling enrolments? Um, look, I expect that, uh, um, that for next year uh, there will be a decrease in the enrolments. And we're doing... Have, uh, you, have you got a figure on that? Oh, look, we're, we're doing... Well, you, you can choose any number you wish. I mean, at the present time, it's pure speculation. Uh, and, so we're, and so we're doing, we're doing a series of uh, scenario plans in terms of what the impacts are likely to be. This program... What's you know, your worst case scenario? Oh, I guess the worst case would be no students, but of course that won't be the case. Uh, so we're confident uh, that um, over at least a two or three year period, uh, the school will come back to the same sorts of levels that we've got at the present time in terms of enrolments. And indeed, the, the nice thing about this, this program, at present we actually cap our enrolments. Why? Because essentially the school loses money for every student. Every student you take in increases the size of the deficit in the school. A model like this there's actually an incentive for the school to be able to grow its enrolments in the future because it's viable. The school doesn't continually need to be worried about the size of its deficit. It can actually invest for the future. It can grow. It's a difference between having an unsustainable and a sustainable model. So are you saying over the next couple of years with decreased enrolments, that's actually going to save the ANU money? No. The, the staffing level is actually pitched around uh, the sorts of numbers that I mentioned here, and that is well, with an intake uh, of about a total of, of 80 students. In fact, at that level, the, the school will actually produce a slight surplus. If the numbers fall below that, uh, then the, you know, it, it will probably actually bring in a small deficit in the coming years. But we think that's actually manageable through this transition period. What's the timeline on staff changeover? Um, the, uh, the changes will all be complete by the end of this year. What about being um, as I said, we've, we've actually gone through a very detailed process with the union uh, over the last three weeks uh, and have mapped out uh, a, a process which will actually do that. Um, and so um, 
when I say, you know, there will be staff who will immediately put their hand up and say they'd like to separate. And we already know there are a number of, of staff who are actually quite keen to have a separation right now. Um, and so we'll deal with those staff initially and they will be paid all of their entitlements under the uh, university's enterprise agreement. There's then a process of actually looking at the de developing the detailed position descriptions for every one of the uh, the, uh, the new staff. Uh, we also give staff the opportunity uh, to nominate whether they'd like to go into early retirement or transfer to another area of the university. Once we've gone through all those processes, uh, we then actually, under this, look at are there existing positions where the current description of the person pretty much exactly matches the new position. If there's only one person, then they will immediately be transferred into that position. If there are more, uh, then we actually have a selection process. Uh, the selection process goes through the normal selection processes that the university uses with committees. Uh, and indeed, uh, we've indicated to the union that they can have representation on those committees uh, to convince themselves that this is done in an equitable manner. So how much, will will those, how much will those redundancies eat into the savings you're making? They'd be substantial, wouldn't they? Oh, they are. I mean, one of the um, people in, in, in public might be very interested in how generous uh, uh, separation packages are within universities. Uh, and indeed, in, in some cases, uh, staff, the maximum is the staff would receive up to, I think it's 86 weeks uh, of pay uh, as a separation. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the total redundancy uh, will be quite large, uh, and, that's a, and that uh, redundancy is being met uh, not from the school itself, uh, but from, uh, the, uh, from central funds within the university uh, as a transition provision for these changes. Are we talking millions of dollars? Uh, well, it depends. Ultimately, it depends on how many staff are actually declared redundant in this process because we'll be looking to be able to try and relocate as many staff as possible. Um, so, you know, it could be anywhere from, uh, I think, the, uh, uh, it could be anywhere from one to as high as $3 million. So it may be a year or two before you see any savings out of this new plan because of the redundancy costs? That's correct. And what we're doing here is we're planning for the future. This is not a one-off fix. Uh, and indeed, uh, each of the processes that have been used in the past have been things like shaving off a few staff here and there. We're fundamentally changing the model. We're moving it onto a sustainable model, uh, which means that you don't have to revisit this. So yes, there are transition costs, there are downsizing costs in doing this, but what it does is it means that we can actually have a school uh, which is as I said, viable into the future. So how many years would you imagine before the school is on its sustainable budget model? Um, look, I think probably uh, once you take into account the, uh, the, the, uh, any potential impacts on, on student numbers and the, and the transition costs and those sorts of things, uh, I think you're, you're looking at probably a period of uh, two to three years before we're into a sound position uh, where we can actually see this, the school growing and, and vibrant. Just to clarify an earlier point, so you will not now vacate all the positions in the school? That's correct. It's, and in fact, uh, the, we, we actually made some clarifications through the process, so, but the process we've actually worked with the NTU, process consistent with our enterprise agreement, uh, and so we will initially look uh, at all of the other processes which are possible for staff in terms of, as I said, redeployment, early retirement, uh, voluntary separations. But in the end, I expect uh, that you will have a, uh, a core group of, of staff which will be larger than the, the positions which currently exist, uh, and there will be a, uh, a competitive um, uh, selection process for those staff done in an equitable way uh, in, and in accord with the university's normal selection processes. During this process, there were people like Chris Peters who came forward and said that they could get large amounts of philanthropic money to throw towards the school to keep it running the way it was. If you're so poor, why did you talk with Chris Peters and why didn't you take him up on the offer? Let's, let me, well, let's do the mathematics for a moment. Uh, a deficit of 2.9, let's make it 3 million. It's not one or 3 million, it's 3 million every single year. Uh, if you want to do that, uh, then uh, you need an endowment of $60 million invested at 5% to, to give you $3 million. These are large amounts of money. Uh, no one, I think, is going to think that we're going to raise an endowment of that sort of magnitude. Um, Chris, uh, uh, and we're still talking to Chris Peters, uh, and indeed I think the really exciting options here now are to raise a much more modest endowment, $1 or $2 million, uh, which would indeed go a long way to very significantly increasing the amount of one-on-one -on -one tuition which we have. Professor Young, what sort of guarantees can you give that there won't be any reduction in quality of education for students going through the school? Um, look, in fact, I think that there may well be an increase in quality uh, going through the school. 
What you've got at the moment, if you look at most of the indicators of the school, uh, you see a school which is under stress. Now, this is not a criticism of the staff. They're working under incredibly difficult circumstances. But if you look at the research performance of the school, uh, if you look at some of the, um, the, the employment outcomes of the students, if you look at uh, many of the, the student assessments, there's indication that the school, although it's still functioning at a good level, is not as, as vibrant as it was a decade ago. We've got a program here now which indeed uh, can actually build, uh, ha I think has a, a much sounder pedagogy in terms of its, uh, uh, in terms of it, its uh, the underpinning of the degree itself. It builds much stronger pathways into a whole broad range of areas to employment outcomes, to research outcomes. Uh, we can actually give students a broader choice in terms of uh, how they find their one-to-one their -one tuition. And indeed, we can put appropriate quality assurance uh, around that external provision, just as we do in, in every area of the university where we use external staff. So I think this university and other universities around the country uh, are well equipped and experienced in how to build QA systems to be able to do that. So we're very confident that we'll actually develop uh, a music degree which is different to our existing degree. And, and I'm very clear about this. We're mo moving to what I call a university model of music education away from a conservatorium model of music education they both produce high quality performance students. The model we're moving to does that and also produces a broader range uh, of skills, a broader education for students. Do you have any regrets about how this whole saga has been handled by the university? I mean, at one point there, there was quite large protests and at one point there, the union was calling for your head. I mean, do you think it could have been done differently? Oh, look, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Uh, maybe we'd do things differently. Maybe we would have communicated uh, better than we had. And I said hindsight's a great thing. Um, but as I said, this is not the first time uh, this has happened. This is, the, in fact, the fourth or fifth time that there have been issues like this. On every one of those occasions, uh, I think we've had the same sorts of, uh, of responses that we have here. I mean, it's an emotive issue. It's an area where people are passionate. It's appropriate for them to be passionate. Um, so I think uh, that's a, a difficult environment to have... Uh, a logical debate because passions run away uh, and I think that's what you see in this area. Uh, we hope that uh, uh, we actually I think one of the good things about the process although it, although it's very painful and and all those things um, I think we've actually uh, had a process which has actually told us some very clear things about what's important about an education and we've responded to those things. But those clear yeah. things from the students are saying they don't want this, the staff doesn't want this, the student doesn't want this, you know how can you justify these actions if it's just purely on this financial basis? Um, look, the, 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 what the students... It's, it's actually interesting to talk to the students um, because the, the students are, uh, also raise concerns about their current degree as well, but then they say, please don't change it. Um, it's, it's quite expected. I mean, these students came here to do a particular sort of education uh, and we're going to guarantee that they'll be able to complete their degrees exactly that they enrolled in. But there will be another cohort of students out there who will be attracted by the new form of education we have, just as many other universities around the, around the world effectively do this. So obviously, if you, if you as a student came here to do a particular thing for a particular sort of education, and we're going to change that, then it's perhaps not the, the education that you would have chosen as an individual. So I think their response uh, is, is very normal, expected. You've also got to realise that because those students you know, work on a, on, a, on a daily basis, one-to-one -one with those staff, they develop a very personal relationship with those staff. And so they're obviously concerned about the future of the staff themselves. And you need to understand you know, those, those very real human emotions that exist there. So I think the reaction of the staff is, is what you would expect. And I did, I, indeed, I think you can understand the reaction of the students. And it's quite a, you know, it's quite a reasonable response that they've made. Do you respect to the teacher um, when the university made changes to the drama program, uh, there was a huge amount of student distress because uh, choice of subjects was reduced quite dramatically. Yeah. Um, is that sort of thing going to happen for current students? Uh, well, I certainly don't believe so. Um, and I think that um, this university and I think uh, universities around the country have actually learnt a lot about these transition processes in, in recent times. Um, so we're not, for instance, we're not simply saying if you're a second year student this is what's going to happen to you. Uh, we're going to take each individual student, sit down with each individual student, map exactly every course that you've done now, what other courses you need to do to be able to complete your program. So it will be an individually tailored process for that student. Now, of course, you know, students will always say that you know, they, they want a greater choice of subjects and, and courses. Um, 
we provide what you know, the university can, can reasonably provide in that, and so we will continue to do that. Oh, look, it's, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to speculate at this point. I mean, there's <coughs> going to be, there will be uh, both existing courses for them to take. There will be courses out of the new program that they can take as well. Um, so if there are some things which are lost from one, I think that they will be replaced by the other, and that's what we're trying to do. We're actually looking at, you know, what are the requirements for you as a student? How can we actually meet those same learning outcomes for you? Given the backlash against this and the hit to the uni, some PR and that sort of thing, has it been worth it? Uh, look, I think it has. I mean, uh, as I said, this is not a whim that I thought up last week. Uh, it's been a systemic problem that's existed within the university for more than a decade. It comes around and around. Uh, and the sorts of, of uh, sums we're talking about are not insignificant. Uh, and they directly impact on other parts of, of the institution. So uh, I think that uh, in doing my job, uh, in ensuring that we can actually produce quality right across this great institution, you have to tackle some of these difficult problems. Uh, and I think that's what being a, a high quality institution is all about. It's being able to use your resources, your human resources, your financial resources, to produce the best learning outcomes for all of your students. And that's what we're about. And is this it? Are we locked in that this is definitely what's going to happen? Is there any more approvals that have to happen, um, consultation? Because uh, initial reports are that the union and, and staff aren't happy with what they're announcing today. Uh, no, this is the this is the this is the decision from the consultation process. So, that from the university's point of view, the decision has been made. Um, uh, in terms of the union, um, obviously they will make a response. Uh, but we have actually, uh, as I say, over the last three weeks, we've worked with the union in terms of developing a process that they've indicated that they agree with. Now. They may change their mind this afternoon, um, but we've we've consulted broadly with them. We've done that in good faith. Uh, we're working uh, within uh, the provisions of our enterprise agreement, uh, and we've worked through that agreement. We've gone through the consultation process, uh, and this is the decision at the end of that consultation process. You talked in, about in coming weeks testing the appetite of the Canberra community for its philanthropic largesse. What's the timeline on that, and how are you going to test the appetite? Um, uh, uh, Chris Peters was mentioned before. Uh, Chris is an important player in this. Uh, we're having discussions with him. Uh, we also have the University Foundation. Uh, we have the Friends of the School of Music. Uh, and indeed, we have the School of Music Foundation. So these are all groups uh, which we'll be bringing together uh, to actually have that discussion uh, to determine just what sort of campaign you might run around this. Um, and I think there's an opportunity here for the people of Canberra. They've very clearly said how passionate they are around music. Um, I've said, here's a program which will be viable for the first time in decades, uh, which you can actually invest in and know that you're investing in something which is going to thrive. Uh, and indeed, uh, you know, the, the School of Music will succeed, indeed, uh, if, in if the, if the uh, people within Canberra get behind it and, uh, and support it. There's an opportunity to do that here. You can see... Um, whether you're large or small, uh, I think you've got an opportunity here to really see how you can take what I think now is a model which is viable uh, and build it to something which is truly great. Recognising what you said about minimum um, standards and the like, for a student who is starting next year, are they going to get more or less um, practical one-on-one -on -one teaching, performance teaching, um, compared to what someone who's been going through the system in the last few years gets? As a minimum, they will get exactly the same as a student gets now. So we're guaranteeing students that they get a minimum um, of one hour per week of one-to-one, -one, which is the same as they get now. Just so you know, uh, I understand that's the highest of any uh, music school or, cons or con conservatorium in Australia. Um, and indeed, uh, so that's the, that's the minimum which we will guarantee. Um, as I said before, uh, if we can actually build an endowment, we will go beyond that. But the students we're going through at the moment, are they just getting the one hour or some of them getting more? No, as I understand it, one hour is what they get. Um, the, I've had discuss, this is Manhattan School of Music. I've actually had discussions with both the president and the vice president of the Manhattan School of Music. Uh, the university has a, uh, an MOU with them. And that's really around uh, a video conferencing system uh, between uh, ANU and the Manhattan School of Music. Um, I want to make it very clear, um, and if there were any, any confusion about this before, um, video conferencing is not going to be used as a substitute for one-on-one -on -one teaching. Uh, it's uh, a supplement to that. It's something extra that you, you can add. Uh, we do that now. We'll continue to do it in the future. Um, but the Manhattan School of Music has no direct part to play in these changes. But 
will they continue to have an association with the School of Music under the new curriculum? Uh, when I spoke to the, uh, the president uh, some two weeks ago, he indicated that uh, he was keen to keep the relationship with ANU. Um, I'm in fact going to be in New York in the next two weeks and we'll have a further meeting with the president there. And was that conversation after the letter sent by uh, one of their staff to students and of course yourself? Yes, it was. Okay. For someone who's coming to this a little bit later, um, given the you know, changes which you've made to the proposal along the way, um, what things can you point to in today's plan which have changed dramatically from that last version from a few weeks ago? Um, we've simplified the model uh, for the degree. Um, in the previous one we had, I think, four or five streams to the program. We've simplified it to simply two. Uh, and we've done that for, for two reasons. One, just because I think it the optics of it make it simpler to, to explain. Uh, the second one is to actually highlight the performance uh, element uh, within the group. So that's one change. So we've actually changed the, uh, the formal uh, structure. Uh, we've recognised the importance of one-on-one uh, -on -one tuition and, in fact, uh, we've increased uh, the amount of that within the, uh, the existing program. So I think they're the two uh, really significant changes in terms of, of the, the structure of the degree uh, and, indeed, uh, ensuring that we have the appropriate level of one-on-one -on -one tuition. There are other um, parts of the university that don't balance their books. Do you have any further plans uh, to cut budgets around the university? Um, the, uh, the, uh, there are actually, one of the um, things which uh, I introduced in the budget this year uh, was explicit cross-subsidies for a number of areas, and there are three. Um, and so they're music, art, and Asian languages. Uh, and so within the university's budget, we explicitly recognise that these are areas which, for no fault of their own, will not be able to, to work within a, in a current um, uh, budget environment. Uh, and so uh, all of those areas get explicit cross-subsidies within the university budget, and that will continue into the future. But there are other areas other than those three which don't balance the books? Uh, not areas, uh, not areas which have systemic budgets. I mean, you know, any any area will, you know, from time to time have budget issues for one reason or another, uh, and when they arise, we always address those in in appropriate ways. Um, so I'm not aware of any other areas of the university which you know have a systemic model of delivery, which simply means they can't they can't uh, uh, fund their their self in a, in a viable way. Colleagues, I'm getting uh, a wind-up uh, signal from, from my colleagues here. So uh, can I thank you all for, uh, for coming along today? Um, I think you have a copy of a very detailed implementation plan there, uh, which I think gives not only uh, clearly defines how we're going forward, but I think also gives uh, a very good background uh, to the real issues that we're trying to solve here today. Thank you very much.